and what to avoid when you're hiring translators and interpreters. Uh, okay, here we are. Let's start out with this word, mokusatsu. I uh, got the chat room open. If anybody knows what this means or why this word is important, go ahead and put it up there for chatting. It is a Japanese word. If you're a history buff, you might have heard about it. So I don't th see anything coming up yet. Um, but if you have any ideas of what this is, go ahead and put it up. All right, so mogusatsu is a word that was the response from the Japanese premier uh, during the World War II. So in World War II in July of 1945, the Allies sent Japan a declaration of surrender and they stated any negative answer would equal, quote, prompt and utter destruction. Well, the Japanese premier replied with mokusatsu um, and his intention for this was, you know, let's just stay silent and let's not make a comment right now. Um, it, but the translator who worked on it translated it into let's ignore it or reject it, which was taken as a prompt and utter destruction response and thus the dropping of uh, the atomic bombs on Hiroshima or Nagasaki. So you can see one word can have lots of meanings in one language, but if the translator doesn't know the intent or the meaning, it can have a really bad effect. All right, so a little bit about Rapport International and what we do, and then I'll talk a little bit about myself just so you know uh, why I'm doing this presentation. We do translation, which is written, uh, and we provide interpreters, which is spoken. We also do transweblation, which is to help companies with the translation of their website and all the copy that has to go up there now and the managing that for social media and inbound marketing. In addition, we've done diversity training, uh, cultural consulting, and global marketing, brand name testing, brand name naming. So this is me. I don't have the video on today. Just the computer that I have doesn't have it. And I'm thankful for that. I am the owner of Rapport International for the last 15 years. The company was founded over 30 years, well, actually 30 years ago, because this is our 30th anniversary year. And uh, we provide 100% satisfaction guarantee, and we've had 100% on-time delivery. We manage that. So through the years, I've really gotten to learn a lot, particularly in the, the legal industry. And so that's um, what I'm here to share with you today. So again, I had asked, you know, what do you want to learn? What are you struggling with? Love to hear any of your chats up there. I don't, I, I don't see any yet. So I'll go with the agenda. With First, we'll cover some definitions. So when I use the word translation, you know what I mean, um, versus interpretation. And then we'll get we'll deep dive into translation and look at some of the specific challenges and what are the control things you can do so you don't run into any uh, problems. And then in person, we'll talk about the different types of uh, interpreting that there is. I also have a YouTube video that I'm hoping displays okay on here and you can hear it. We've tested it out, it seems to work fine, but it gives a perfect example of what not to have an interpreter do. So it's funny. Uh, but it also it drives the point home on some things that I'd like you to learn. So on um, translation, that is written. It has to do with text. And you'll often hear people in the industry talking about your source text and your target text. Your source text is the original text that it was in. It's the source, and the target is the language it's going into. You hear uh, globalization, localization, translation, uh, thrown around and translation is the more general term globalization is say you take a legal contract and you put it into Spanish so your client can use that around the world that would be globalized because it's one well-written Spanish that can be read and by any Spanish speaking person localization brings it down even narrower to a local market that might um, 
to make it really appropriate. So if you're marketing something in the United States, states if it's Boston in particular, you might use um, Faneuil Hall or some of the other landmarks around here to really show that it's Boston local, whereas in California or Texas, you'd use something different. So that's the same with the Spanish translation. Which country do you, you know, really want to focus on? And then you're getting down into... Uh, sports athletes, what currency is used, are there certain colors or phrases that are very local to that country. So I see a lot of that more in the marketing translation. Tran and then there's transliteration and meaning. Transliteration is where you're actually taking word for word and you're putting it down into what that word means. And this is more the formula of what Google Translate would use. So they are tracking words for words to try to do it. You're not getting the human intervention that is trying to figure out what the meaning is. Okay, so in interpretation, you have uh, consecutive, simultaneous, and telephone and video. Consecutive would be a deposition. Simultaneous would be somebody in court that's telling, um, one of the people involved in the court proceedings, what's going on as the judge is talking, or if you think about the UN where you have one speaker and one language going out to many people who speak different languages and they're all wearing headsets. And there is also telephone interpreting and video interpreting. Okay, so I do have a question. Um, and request um, what to cover. One of the things I've struggled with in bringing an interpreter in client meetings without offending my client, in a couple of situations, I felt the ethical thing to do on my end was to ensure an interpreter was present in our meeting because my client did not seem to be fully grasping what I needed him to understand. Some clients have seemed to find this insulting. Do you have any tips? Absolutely. So when we get to the inter uh, interpreting section, um, I will uh, definitely cover that. Okay, so let's start out with translation. So here's an English example. Any person who shall maliciously and willfully discharge a firearm at an inhabitant house occupied building, da 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 da, is guilty of a felony, da 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 da. Okay, so this was translated in the original language you would put in the word at, because it means that you're at that location and you're doing it. When they translate the word at into English, it means you're not allowed to shoot the house. So it's not talking about the people that are in the house or what's going on around the house. They're talking about shooting directly at the house. Now, um, in Slovak, you'd use the at word to say that it's in that location. So this is something that, it, that if the person is not trained in translation, you could run into in an illegal document that could cause a problem. So when I, talked about, when I talk about trained translators, they, they do have schools for this. If you Google translation school in Europe, you come up with hundreds of them. If you do that here in the United States, you get very few. Now I'm happy to say that Bunker Community College has added one. Um, and there's a couple other ones that are popping up in Massachusetts. When I looked uh, five to 10 years ago, there, was n there, there may have been one school in Massachusetts that was doing it. Boston University is another one that's doing it in the local area. So you can actually get a degree in it now. Um, so a trained translator will usually have a background and a specialty in a certain area, and then they're taught how to use the language and when to ask questions. So some of the things that they're taught to use is appropriateness. Um, we're often asked, if I, if I give you this document that's written for a population of a fifth grade level, will that stay the same? Now that's called the register of where it is. And there's a formula to figure out what the reading level is. Um, and we will always keep that, or a professional translator will always keep that at the same register because they're trying to meet the audience. So you can imagine with legal documents, you can have everything from a contract that's gonna be online for somebody signing up for a software that they're never going to, to do it, to communications that need to go out from um, public entities, to a very complex IP 
contract. And so all those can have varying uh, registers. Just on a side note, blockbuster books uh, are written at a seventh grade level, so the Harry Potter series. Newspapers are at an 11th grade level. I think that would have to be dependent on the newspapers, though, because I know some that aren't. And the average U.S. person reads at a seventh or eighth grade level. Um, so other things, of course, you'd expect grammatical, um, grammatical correctness and correct spelling. Um, and other non-parallel internationalisms, they're called. And so if I say, say I do something and I'm in a Spanish-speaking country and I speak some Spanish and I get very embarrassed about what I do and I say, oh, I'm embarrassada, yo soy embarrassada. Um, that has a very different meaning. You sound like you're making it in Spanish, but it actually means I'm pregnant. So there's lots of words like this across different languages that uh, translators really know the difference of to make sure to capture the meaning. And the conceptual adequacy also means, it means that the translator is going to look at the words that are used and then they're going to make it appropriate for the culture. So oftentimes I'll have clients ask, well, will you, will you make this cultural appropriate or will you let us know? So I remember years ago, I got a, um, there was like an Ebony magazine. So it was targeted at, at an African-American population. And there was this big back cover ad on the back from an insurance company. And it had this lily white family hanging out the car, smiling and waving. And I thought, who was the marketing person that did this? Because it, it just missed the target market. So we are always looking for cultural um, appropriateness like that. Good translators are always looking. So we're, when I say we, I'm talking project managers. So you want your project managers. You want the translators to be looking for it. And then if you have uh, any culturally aware people that you're continually looking for. It. But it even comes down to the words. And I give the example here of we have lots of different words for um, on, on minors. And, the, uh, you know, in some languages, they don't have that. So you'd have to define minor less than 15 year old, years old and make it appropriate. It's just like in Chinese, there's lots of different words for love, but you have to know the right one that has to be used. Um, and then you have the stylistic adequacy and graphical quality. There's also some languages, this is very interesting, that don't have a future tense. And there's been research done to find out that um, language and tenses and words can actually influence behavior. So languages that don't have a future tense are consistently better at saving than languages that do have a future tense. So for example, in English, we have the future set tense. We don't save. Whereas in, um, let me see, Chinese, German, Japanese, Norwegian, they don't separate between the future and the present. So you, so there's this mindset of, I need to do it now because my now is my future. So good translators are going to be aware of all this. And then you get into specific legal things like hold an interest. So, you know, in, in the U.S., holding an interest means can, can mean ownership, just not an interest in doing stuff. And then title, deeds, and certificates. So a, a legal translator is going to understand the legal system enough to not only take it in the English language and make it appropriate if it's going to be used in another country and out of the U.S. legal system. So these are some other, other words um, that in the legal industry, industry really have an effect. And you can have, I mean, the example I like on this is you can have an illegitimate child, but you would never have an illegal child, um, you know, in the concept that we're talking about it. All right, so some additional challenges that you might see in legal when you're getting a translation is the asymmetry of legal systems. So what we have here in the United States is different from other legal systems all over the place. So you want a legal translator that understands that. Uh, the, the terminology, religious influences that can be on there. So there's, there's a lot of considerations that somebody who is bilingual may not have thought through what the differences are 
and trained translators do think through uh, what the differences are in it. When they have questions, they're taught to come back and ask. All right, so quality control, that's what we're really looking for. What you can do is pay attention to your English writing. We get some stuff in that's done very quickly. It's not well written, and it's very difficult for the translator to try to get the meaning across on that. So there's been times where we've caught errors, and we'll take it back and say, hey, did you see this? Um, it could be as simple as a date. It could be more complex on, you know, what are you trying to say here? And then we'll help them um, figure that out. And, and when I say we, I'm talking about a good translation agency. Um, explain your intentions for the translation. So it's not unusual when you, you know, you'll say, hey, can I get a quote on this? And somebody from the agency might want to call you and say, okay, let's, let's talk about this. What's the market? What's the, you know, they might be looking for whether you want to globalize, localize, when you, whether, to, whether you need any layout on it. Um, time is another thing that we run into. You take the time to write the contract and then you think, ooh, I can get the translation done in a day. There's a couple of rules of thumb to use. One is allow the same amount of time that you use to write the document as you would to translate the document. The other rule of thumb is to allow a thousand words per day to budget out your time for how long it'll take. And most translators, can work faster than that, but that allows for time of getting the project in, started, any questions handled, anything that any changes need to come up and then to get done. Um, and if you have edits, this is a good one. If you have edits, always take them back to the translator because it's not unusual for a client to, to call an agency back. And, and I people feel bad about it. They'll say, you know, well, we got these complaints or these problems. They said it was a bad translation. And when I first owned the company, I'd go, oh, my God, it's a bad translation. I'm going to go into a panic. And now I've gotten to, I, you know, that's fine. You can tell me it's a bad translation. But I know we stand behind it, and I know who's doing it. So I want to know why you think it's a bad translation or your whoever gave you the feedback and I've seen everything from um, it was just a preference rather than saying supper they wanted to say dinner um, it could have been that it was in it, company specific terminology that they wanted to use so they took out the word that we had used and they wanted to be consistent with another one. We do build glossaries for our long-term clients, so we make sure that it stays consistent and they're having the, the same message go out. Uh, it could, we, we had a situation once where a support person who had had training in Spanish review the document and make edits to it and changed the message. And so I talked to the person who procured the translation and explained that, and it was a, a political issue for the company. So we had to talk about whether it was grammatically wrong or whether it was changing the message and could they live with the message. So we went back and forth on that for a while, and the, the translator was very adamant. It was, you know, I can't put my name to this translation because... The message is different, but we could work with the client and figure out how to solve that. Um, and so the other reason that we always want to know what the edits are is not only to, to make sure you get the best quality that you can, make sure you feel most comfortable with it, but we, and then the, to keep your voice, but we also want to have an archive of it. We have one client that's worked with us for over 25 years, and they've had a transition of people come in. And so when they want to reuse something, they know we've got the original one, so we're, we're keeping the archive. So again, I'm saying we, but I'm talking about a good translation agency. And then hire the right agency. So you want to work with somebody that works with your style. You'd find out that they, um, you know, that you find it easy to work with. So selecting an agency, what would be easy to work with? Is they, they have subject matter expertise. You know, if they're only doing one type of translation or they specialize in interpretation and you need a translator or they're, um, I, I know a competitor that does a lot of discovery translation, which can be boxes and boxes and boxes of material, and he runs it through the machine translation to get the gist for it, and then can boil it down to just the part that you want. Uh, so that's his specialty that he's developed. Um, how, how do they screen the translators? I know of an agency 
that is very good with their clients. They keep them very happy, but the in the industry, the translators don't like working with them because the project managers never remember who they've worked with and they're always scrambling around to say, hey, can you do something? So they're just, they're just looking for somebody who hung up a sh shingle to say, hey, I can do translation just to get it done. You know, I don't, I don't, I, I don't think that's a good way to manage quality, but you know, they, they've got excellent customer service on the, the front end. Um, so what, what kind of timing are you the type of person that, um, allows extra time and wants a very detailed methodical process? And then I'll, I'll ask about their quality control process and how do they manage that? All right. So quality control. This is the question I get a lot. I don't speak the language, so I don't know if it's quality. So it's more of a bury the head in the sand and hope for the best. But that's not the case. There are uh, lots of ways that you can manage quality. The first is you get a good translator. If we're doing a translation for a school who's doing a letter out to the parents, they may just use one very good translator. They don't tend to have an editor on their work because their, their, their material is short, it's very um, easy to understand, and they have um, budget constraints. Now, for anybody that's doing something long, technical, um, or trying to get a, a message across that could really have a, a legal or financial implication, we do rec recommend an editor. That's an equally qualified person like a translator. So if you write something and you want to know that it's good, you're going to have somebody proofread it. So that's what you'd use an editor for. There's also... There's machine translation, which is Google Translate, which will give you the gist, the quality is not there to use. But there's translation memory that has gotten very good. And so say you do a contract and you keep archives of your contracts and you pluck up paragraphs and you can reuse them. Uh, I think some of you might do that. Translation memory would say, aha, I recognize this paragraph. I'm going to pull that and give it a hundred percent match so I know it's the same thing. It stays consistent all the time. So you're not redoing translation all the time. Another level to go is a client reviewer. So if you have somebody in country or in your firm that speaks the language, you can have them review it. There's certified translations. This we do for cases of individuals, immigration attorneys who might need uh, marriage certificates, birth certificates, death certificates translated. And the reason you do a certified translation is to show that nobody party to the case did the translation, that an independent uh, person did it. So I do those quite a bit, get them notarized that our, our firm is the firm that did it. Um, so they can submit that to the court. We also have done certified translations for life sciences companies that are going to have to present to the FDA and they have to prove that they got a good translation. Uh, I also get asked about back translation. The, I, I do not say this is a good way uh, to prove quality. This is like whisper down the alley. If you take something and you translate it, somebody translate it translate it back. Every time you do a translation, uh, you, you could, you lose a little bit of the meaning. Um, but it is one way that companies will prove that they got a good translation, particularly in the life sciences, legal FDA um, area. And another way is to do um, audience testing or focus groups or run it by people who will be using it to, to see if they have any issues with it. Uh, so that, that we see more in uh, the state of Massachusetts when they're doing materials that, is, that are going to be distributed out to the, to the general public. They'll run it by focus groups. In the legal area, these are the ones that have the arrow on that I think, um, I think you can depend on to get a good, good translation. So what about your quality process management. So not only is it the people in the process that you're doing, but as with anything in business, so I've got my MBA, my training, I always like to look at the process to see what's going on. So if you have a mistake that happens, what you're going to want to look at, is it the people, is it the process, or is it the training? 
So if a mistake happens and, you know, if it's repeatedly happening specifically, you want to make sure that you have the right people on the job. If they seem to be the right people and they're hardworking and they're smart and they know what they're doing, but a mistake got happened, then you can go over to the training. Have they had the appropriate training to do what they're doing? Um, and if they've had the training and they know how to do it, then you look at the process. So is there something in the process that is not working? Um, and this is the same kind of uh, view that you can put on the, on the process for translation to look. So you want to hire the right people. You want to make sure that your staff is trained on how to do everything. And you want to make sure that you have a process. When we first start working with a client, it's slow to bring them on. But now, you know, there's barely any communication because we know what they want and what they're doing. Okay, so let's get into interpretation, change our hats a little bit. This is more the people to people. You have a different type of person that goes into interpretation. They're the ones that like to keep a schedule. They're running around. They're all about helping people. Uh, whereas translators keep a bunch of, or, you know, in the olden days, dictionaries on their desk. Now we have the internet to do it, and they are more like writers. So you got your presenters and you got your writers. Um, so let's do a little uh, chat here. How many people just type yes into the chat if you've presented with a consecutive interpreter? Um, and let and I will cover. I'll go back to the question from Christine that we had is about bringing an interpreter in when it might be insulting to the client. So in this situation, um, you've got somebody who may, who may not be fully bilingual. You may have somebody who brings a child or a family member in. You may have somebody who brings a friend in. Um, in all these situations, you're out of control of sending the message as clear as you can to make sure it's delivered. So when we work with interpreters, um, and we, we just worked with this situation with the doctor's office where the, the, the patient says, no, I don't need somebody in here, and the front, staff is, front desk staff is trying to decide whether to send the interpreter away or have them come in. And our, our policy is, is if you've hired somebody, they're going to be there. So why not have them in the room there? So even if they're not doing the interpreting, they're helping to facilitate the conversation. I think with your client that you don't want to offend them, you're, you're positioning it that um, we're having, as part of the legal system here, you're entitled to have an interpreter to help facilitate the conversation. I would like the person to be here in case there's legal terminology to help explain, and I'd like them to sit in. And oftentimes, in this situation, we've had the client might turn to the person and speak in the other language um, to ask for clarification. And so I'm going to talk about if that happens, and then they go off and start talking in the other language, and then your client comes back and responds to you, how can you can control that situation to make sure that you're not left out of the, um, the conversation? But I think if you go, you know, number one, it's part of our legal system to make sure that everything is understood. Number two, I don't know some of the words in your language, and we're going to get into some technical legal uh, information here that I want to make sure is clear for you. You may not need an interpreter, but for my comfort level, I would like to have somebody here to help facilitate the conversation. If, if, if it's interfering, the person can just be here in case we need them. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I would like to hear more and maybe when we open it up at the end about what they're, what they're saying or how you're picking up on how they're finding that insulting because usually when it's positioned this way, they, they go, okay, they're here to help. Um, I find the biggest concern that people who don't speak English with is if an interpreter is there, are they going to be um, liable to pay for it? So this is, so this I'm talking more of the immigrant community that's come here to learn. If you're working with a, a clientele or that is 
much more educated and sure of their English, that's a whole other consideration. Um, and I don't run into that as much. So, so type up a, a chat on there um, if there's something more on that. So the purpose of an interpreter is really to help. Okay, so we talked about training for a translator, training for an interpreter is a little bit different. They're told you're just supposed to give messages, you're supposed to clarify, help with culture. So I heard about a situation where an executive went over to Japan and he, he, he relied heavily on his interpreter for all the protocol that goes along with the Japanese culture. And at one point, he, the, the interpreter um, told him, okay, at this point, you, you kneel across the room to show respect. And he thought the interpreter was joking, but wasn't. And he was able to do that, and it became a much more successful um, business meeting. So these people are very astute in what's going on between the languages, and they're very good at explaining it. So you do want to use that. And if you're presenting with an interpreter, uh, you do want to meet with that person beforehand and come up with any signal systems to help the interpreter tell you to slow down, speed it up, or, or how to present and go through material. So most of the time I'm going to be talking today on consecutive interpreting for with depositions as, as opposed to presenting to an audience um, like you might do at the UN because I think it would be more appropriate for this for for legal interpreting okay so now let's go to this little video because this is where the interpreter gets out of control so I want to show that and then we can go back to what you can do to take back control of the situation uh, to make sure you're getting what you want and what you'll see on there is that it's a very obtrusive relationship. So an interpreter is purely supposed to work like a phone. You talk into it and the message goes across and then the message comes back to you. So interpreters are trained that they should stand off a little bit to the side you and your client or whoever you're meeting with should have eye contact and you should be facing each other. So you speak in the first person and it goes directly. So the interpreter is just going to repeat exactly what you say and then the other person speaks and it's exactly what that person says. So what about if there's swear words? The interpreter is taught to repeat everything. They don't have to give the inflection. They don't have to give the, the anger. They don't have to give anything of that. But they are going to give what's called a faithful echo. They're going to repeat it right back. The language of love has no barriers. And this may be true until you try proposing marriage. Well, Jonathan Ralph has this problem. His girlfriend is Cypriot and doesn't speak English. Jonathan doesn't speak Greek. So he's called in this Greek interpreter to help with the marriage plans. The Cypriot girlfriend is played by our own Eve Adam. Where does she come from, if I may ask? She comes from Cyprus. Cyprus, excuse me. Uh, I cannot pronounce the name of the place, I'm afraid. But we met on... In Cyprus or no? No, in, uh, in Greece. Yeah. On, uh, the and uh, we had a wonderful time together there, and now she's come over to... Ah, oh, and here she is. Christine, how oh, lovely to see you. This, um, this is Miss Papadopoulis. Papadopoulis, Papadopoulis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, would you tell my fiance that I'm overjoyed to see her? Myself, not so much. <laughs> she is a little uh, reticent sometimes in front of other people, I think. Um, not only am I overjoyed to see her, but I'm most anxious to know whether she still feels about me the same way as she did when we last met. Yeah. First time? Yes. Yeah. 
εσύ αισθάνεσαι το ίδιο όπως αισθανόσουν το και εγώ που τόσο στην τελευταία σου κάπου ειδωθήκατε. Εγώ αισθάνομαι το ίδιο, ναι, με, δηλαδή δεν μου αρέσει καθόλου αυτός ο άνθρωπος. Ε, ε, yes. He feels very strongly in favor of me, I think. Uh, well, he says, yes, he feels the same, he doesn't like you so much, he says. Oh, I think she uh, has a great sense of fun. <laughs> anyway, I am eagerly looking forward to our wedding. She seems a bit surprised. I expect she's a little excited at the prospect. Wouldn't any girl be surprised at her? Okay, thank you, Rakesh. So now, okay, so while Beverly's working on this, we're going to go forward on this. So I hope you get a kick out of that uh, video as much as I do. When it's a full room, you hear all the laughter. So um, it really cracks me up. So on that, everything about it was wrong. You could see that the interpreter had the position between the two of them. He kind of thought that the guy didn't have, uh, didn't know what he was talking about. He formed a relationship with the woman. Um, he didn't keep the words in a faithful echo, so he wasn't repeating the exact words. Um, he was leaving things out. He doesn't translate at all. He took um, side conversations with both of them. And he was talking to the interpreter and wasn't getting them to look at each other and talk to each other. And he softened the message so much. So, it, so this was wrong. You know it's wrong because the meaning isn't getting across. So what do you do if you get into a situation like this? Well, the first thing you do is you are the boss. You take control of this. You're the one that's trying to communicate with the other person. So you can take control. You tell the interpreter you say i'm going to ask you to repeat exactly what is said i want nothing left out you don't have to soften it and then you turn and you face the client and you speak in first person you want to speak in shorter sentences or phrases so you can give the interpreter time to repeat it exactly as it said if they go off and they do any private talking you want to clarify your expectations and repeat it back. Please repeat exactly what I said. Um, and you want to make sure that you are not going off on too many conversations with the interpreter one-on-one -on -one, um, to leave the client feeling left out. Now, if you have to do that, what you say is, client, I'm going to turn to the interpreter and I'm going to ask him to explain some cultural differences here or whatever the topic can be. Um, please hang with me for a moment while I get this clarified and then I will be back to talk to you. So you've set the expectation with the other person in the room as to what's going on. They're not feeling left out and they know what's being talked, spoken about. Um, and the same thing with if the interpreter has to get clarification because sometimes somebody will use a word you want the interpreter to be able to say to you um, that your client has used has said something that I don't understand. I'm going to ask the person for clarification so I can make sure and get the uh, meaning across correctly. So the interpreter should only be doing side conversation if they're clarifying that from the start. Now, if you ever have any problems with an interpreter, you need to call your agency immediately because they can block the interpreter from there. They're not there. They're not seeing what's going on. And any agency is going to want to know if you're having any issues like that with an interpreter. You should also um, expect uh, uh, professionalism from the um, from them. They should be there. If you have an interpreter hired for two o'clock, they should be there uh, about 15 minutes early. They should be professionally dressed. They should shake hands. They should have eye contact. They should be there for you. So if there's any any question with what's going on, um, 
Oh, okay. So Rakesh got the, uh, so if you can go, go ahead all the way up to the slide where it says speak clearly and it's got a Dilbert comment on it. So you look for a professional interpreter, give the feedback to the agency. Um, if you like someone and you want to keep them on the case, you can certainly call up and request that person to come back for you. Um, Cause that, that also helps form a relationship. So go ahead. If you can keep going. Yes, here, this one. So this is a point that I want to make is don't use gibberish. You're an attorney. You have a lot of specific language. If you're working with a client that might not understand or you're working with another attorney that, that isn't clear on it, try to keep it clear because if you start going off into do we have any actionable analytics from our big data in the cloud and it's not clear, you're going to leave the interpreter hanging and give them a, 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 a challenge. Okay, if you can go on to the next slide. Okay, so in the chat room, I want to see if anybody knows what this is talking about. What activity is this? Um, the LSM pinched and popped, ran it up on the fast break, then ditched it to the point attack, through, then threw it to X. The, the X attack dodged and wrapped around the GLE and scored top shelf. Anybody have any idea what, what activity this is? Go ahead and put, put it in the chat. The L. SM pinched and popped, ran it up on the fast break, then ditched it to the point attack, who then threw it to the X. The X attack dodged and wrapped around the GLE and scored top shelf. So there was, there was a hint a couple of minutes ago as Rakesh was going through the slideshow and, uh, and showed you a picture. So this is, this is the sport that my kids play. Uh, go ahead, Rakesh, if you want to go on to the next one. It is lacrosse. When they first started playing, I had no idea what that meant. But the long stick midi is somebody who has a long pull instead of a short one on here. And this is how they talk about doing an attack. So um, let's open it up for questions. I'm going to go ahead and, um, well, you have chat, you have Q&A. Um, there is a way to raise your hand. So if you raise your hand, I can unmute your microphone and then answer any questions. I feel like I want to be my, um, my professor and cold call on some people. I have your names here. I think you have questions. So while we're waiting for any questions, um, this morning, I had the uh, privilege of seeing Michelle Obama speak. She's over at the in, she was over at the inbound conference this morning, and uh, it was it was quite interesting to hear her. She stayed classy and and didn't get down um, and criticize. And she said that you know that that most former presidents do that because they've actually sat in the seat of the person who's trying to run the country now. So it's, you never see them criticizing the person who's at the helm now. So I thought that was a, a really good point. And uh, very honorable of all our past presidents to do that. Okay, so my um, contact information Huh, I didn't put it on the presentation. So my name is Wendy Pease. I'm on LinkedIn, easy to find. W-E-N-D-Y, P is in Peter, E-A-S-E. -E. The company name is Rapport International. You can see it down in the bottom of the screen. Um, and we do foreign language translation and interpretation. I love to do free project consulting. So if you're trying to figure out a way to handle something, feel free to call at any time and ask. We do um, have a partnership with the Boston Bar Association. We are the preferred vendor. So if anybody um, tells us that they found us through the Boston Bar Association, you get a discount. Um, and so that's really good for the Boston Bar Association that they put that together. They've got some exciting things coming out this year for the members of the Boston Bar. Um, they're a great support organization, so uh, we're, we're hugely excited to be working with the people over here. Uh, so if you have any questions, feel free to get in touch with me. I don't see anything coming across now, um, so we'll go ahead and end this now. Thank you, everybody, for coming. <laughs>